So Elliot Plack is going to talk to us about mapping this amazing park that's just outside of Baltimore. So Elliot, please take it away. Okay, so I want to talk about mapping the Patapsco Valley State Park uh, with the, uh, the government, uh, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and the Friends of Patapsco Valley State Park. Um, little project I've been working on um, for a couple months, and um, as I'll get into uh, longer than that on background. So uh, I've always been interested in, in trail mapping, outdoor activities, um, and ever since I was a little kid, I grew up near a nature uh, reserve uh, and would hike around with my parents on the trails and could never find a good map of this. I always loved maps, never found a good trail map. Um, and as I grew up and discovered OpenStreetMap, I realized it'd be a great place to uh, kind of record that. But, but how do you see a trail like this one uh, when it's covered by woods, you know, uh, looking at like Bing imagery or something? Can't. Um, and then in 2014, uh, at State of the Map US, San Francisco, saw a cool talk by a guy, Paul Mock with Strava about a tool he was working on called Slide, which would allow you to use the Strava heat map to uh, generate trails in OpenStreetMap based on solely on Strava's data. Um, and I started doing that quite a bit. Uh, then I discovered uh, that I could use the LIDAR imagery in my state, LIDAR data, to kind of see through the tree cover. Uh, and I presented about this at uh, the Towson University GIS conference uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and I can also, I'll send the, the slide deck for that too. It's kind of cool. Um, and I won't go too far into that, but you know, LIDAR, it's a remote sensing technology allows you to kind of uh, see the surface of the earth as if there are no trees um, and you can detect little anomalies in the ground where there might be a trail. So uh, as I started mapping trails with slide and LIDAR, um, you know, I, I reached kind of a conundrum that while it looks like there might be a trail there, you don't really know unless you go out and survey it. And that's always the, you know, the open street map kind of a mantra is to uh, survey things that exist in the real world. Um, and even if they do exist, uh, I noticed that the, the names that either I'd put in or other mappers would put in, they didn't, in, they didn't always line up with a kind of reality, like signposted names that are out in the park. And I have a couple highlighted here. Um, and I, I wondered like who would know that? Uh, and for years, I just kind of left it as a, uh, you know, kind of TBD, uh, I would put the trails in, I would go out and try to find them. Um, and you know, that was kind of the, the process. So enter the consumer focused outdoors apps. Um, you all probably know all trails, Strava, Gaia GPS, Trail Force. Um, and, and it's great. There, there's an increasing number of consumer facing or consumer focused apps out there that are using OpenStreetMap data because it's, uh, it's freely available and it's really good data, right? And so you're, you're seeing these, uh, uh, we're seeing kind of mappers coming into the project from those platforms. Um, and at Patapsco, which is a very popular mountain biking uh, among other uses area in the Baltimore region, um, started to see trails being edited uh, or added to kind of uh, benefit these apps or maybe influence them. Like folks would add, you know, bicycle equals yes to a trail, uh, which might not necessarily be wrong, but they would do it to just specific trails, kind of get them to show up in the, the various rendered, uh, you know, bike maps on the web. Um, and this started a couple of years ago as those uh, these apps kind of enter the fray uh, and, and began to, we began to notice kind of some conflicts, uh, especially like over the naming um, of trails where local people just kind of come up with names. Uh, there's a famous trail in the park called Drugs 
uh, like I take drugs, right? But I don't take drugs, but, uh, and this words like this sort of would um, not mesh well with the OSM kind of like QA tools. And I started to see, uh, you know, Mapbox and some of these other platforms starting to question these names, right? Who would name a trail drugs? Is that a real trail name? Uh, and you go out there, there's no sign that says that. It's just sort of known in the local lingo. Um, so people would remove the name and then someone else would go and add it back. Um, a lot of these names appear on like uh, Strava segments uh, in, in all trails as a, a name trail and things like that. Um, so where, while that kind of thing was going on, people were, you know, editing, have been editing trails for, um, as I said, the, uh, the parks started to put together these info boards um, with, uh, you know, information about trails. And then they, they wanted to uh, make maps, inset maps to go on the trails. And what they've been doing is essentially taking open street map data and using that to power the trail maps that appear on the, the official signage in the park. Uh, and this has created a conflict in that the, you know, the state land managers um, and the a group called the Friends of Patapsco Valley State Park, that is sort of a advocacy uh, kind of fundraising arm, uh, you know, non-governmental organization. They realize that, you know, they, they make a draft of this info board, and hey, there's a trail named Drugs that that doesn't work. We can't show that on our official sign. So they, they might just go and delete it or change the name or something like that. And then someone else would come in and say, no, that's really called that. Um, and and they, these conflicts um, kind of became known to me. Um, and I started to reach out to the, uh, the park to see if we could work as a community to figure out like how to map these things uh, in a kind of standard way that would be community accepted. Um, so uh, they wanted to rectify things like naming, um, adding routes, basically creating like a, a large tour that you could uh, use to kind of navigate around the park using a GPS, um, working on sort of uh, mapping these official trails, where they are versus what's informer, uh, informal. Um, and uh, essentially like to uh, tap into all the data, all the trail data on the map and say kind of like what's good and what's questionable. Um, and that's what we did. So um, over the past few months, I started uh, meeting with the friends and the, the park ranger uh, in person, virtually via email. And we got together and figured out what's a good way to handle all these things. I have a couple of points here. Um, you know, I mentioned the, uh, the closing of trails or uh, like deleting trails that don't exist. This is a, a popular, I wouldn't say popular, but a, a kind of a common, uh, you know, dispute in the community is when something is added that is there, but park manager doesn't want it to be there because they don't want it to show up on the map, something like that. Um, so we, you know, we talked about how to um, either mark those things as, as informal or to altogether close a trail that is in fact closed. Uh, and there are trails, you can't see it from the air, of course, but on the ground there are signs and, um, you know, they have like caution tape over them and things like that. The, the park management makes an effort to prevent people from going down paths that are um, either unsafe or erosion prone or in a you know environmental remediation area. Um, and they wanted to update the, the data accordingly. Um, so in our meetings, I showed how they could use the, uh, uh, the life cycle prefixes, some of you may be familiar, um, to essentially mark a trail as um, you know, closed or uh, dismantled or, you know, whatever the, the kind of uh, status is. And the advantage there, as I explained, is that uh, 
if you mark a trail as closed that way, it's still in the map data. So if another mapper comes along and tries to add it back, they will see it's there, but it's just marked as uh, closed so that, you know, then you don't get uh, maybe the edit war as much. Um, we talked about how to add routes using um, either ID or JOSM. Um, and they, uh, the number of people in the, the friends of Patapsco actually picked up pretty quickly how to do like route uh, and relation work in ID, which I was impressed by. Um, and we came up with a kind of standard tagging spec to, um, to cover trails that they've worked on, how to add things like trees and grassy areas to improve the, the way the maps look. Um, and, uh, and finally, we, we, did, we took a look at the trail areas, or I should say the park areas. And this is something that I think could be applicable to other uh, parts of the country where the park is uh, you know, 3,000 acres, some massive amount of uh, land, but it's broken up into these areas. Um, and we figured out kind of where the boundaries are of these areas. Um, with the rangers who are currently working on putting out uh, signposts and sort of information to match these areas. Uh, we got that all put into OSM as nature areas. That way they kind of show up on the maps and they've started to show up in, you know, all trails, things like that. Helping people kind of recognize where they are in the park um, if they're using one of these apps and you know, have an issue, want that to kind of match what the the park people recognize as the name of the area. Because again, uh, sometimes there's an informal name for an area, uh, you know, like I said, drugs. And you call 911 and say, help, I fell and broke my leg. I'm on the drugs trail. The 911 guy is going to be like, well, I don't know where that is. Uh, so wanted to help people kind of with wayfinding and whatnot through the use of this OSM data, which appears in these other apps. Um, so, um, so I have a, um, now I'm going to do it on time, Jess, by the way, I started a stopwatch, so a couple minutes. Too I would late. say, yeah, a couple more minutes. Okay, good. Well, that kind of concludes my presentation. I thought I could just sort of scroll around here um, on the map and show a couple of examples. Um, so this is... Tapsco Valley State Park uh, is this kind of large green area to the west and uh, southwest of Baltimore City. And uh, zoom in here, see there's quite a bit of detail, a lot of trails. Um, an example where we've been working recently uh, is over here. There's a, a new trail uh, called the Gray's Mill Trail. And um, I worked with the park management to kind of help them put this in and then kind of tag it accordingly. So um, if you see here, this trail, we've got uh, access tags, you know, what's allowed, what's not. Um, and importantly, the operator and operator wiki data uh, to sort of identify that this trail is a, a managed trail by this organization because they are the uh, sort of recognized trail manager uh, within the park on the official stuff. Uh, put a website in, uh, which resolves to a real nice website with some information. Um, and just work with them to, to help them kind of figure out how to make this stuff uh, like look authoritative in that it would, you know, because there is no, OSM is really a true democracy in terms of, right? I mean, who can edit just about anyone? Um, so there's no way to prevent someone from going in and deleting this or something. But uh, you know, I thought by trying to make it uh, look authoritative, that would help it. Um, we put in some relations, and I'm probably running out of time here, um, that appear in, uh, you can see like in Waymark Trails, a useful application, uh, to highlight some of the routes. Um, we've got this. Uh, it's called the Patapsco Traverse uh, in here that sort of uh, goes up and down both sides of the entire park. Um, and 
they went in and the, the friends folks actually added this themselves. I didn't, I wasn't a, uh, directly involved. Uh, and in so doing, they've come across, you know, issues in the park with the trail system that were not right, stuff like that. So there's a lot of really cool kind of collaboration over the, uh, the adding these routes that you, you kind of find. Uh, that's and great. Through. Yeah, that's so, amazing. I, I want to go do that whole length of trail now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 50 kilometers. Have fun. <laughs> Thanks, um, Elliot. So, yeah, excellent. Um, I'm sure we have so many questions. I know I do, but let's go ahead and go ahead into Colleen Coyne's presentation. She is here from Kaboom, which is an organization that helps put playgrounds in places where they are needed. And I will let her do more of the introduction because she knows a lot more about it than I do. Thank you. Um, I don't have a formal PowerPoint and presentation I'm going to share. I like to have a conversation. Um, it is a little intimidating come a, coming off of all of Elliot's really great data. Um, so I'll share a little bit about Kaboom, Kaboom first and then uh, sort of why I'm here, why we're interested in mapping. Um, so Kaboom is a national nonprofit dedicated to play. That looks like a lot of different things, but especially over the last few years, it's meant working um, directly with communities to help them build really great new places to play, um, specifically through the lens of place-based equity. And so when we're thinking about place-based equity, it is really focused on creating quality opportunities for kids to play where they feel like they belong and are safe. Um, found across the country as we've observed park systems we work in, school systems we work in, housing systems we work in, is that access to safe quality places to play is not equal across the country. Um, there are communities that are disproportionately affected by lack of access to public amenities. It's a trend we see sort of across the board, but um, play spaces continue that trend. And so what, what we've seen sort of like anecdotally and in conversations with cities is that in communities where the majority of the residents are Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and or where the majority of the residents are low income, they tend to have access, less access. And when they do have access, they have access to smaller, less quality places to play. Um, but the fact of the matter is we only know that's true in a couple of places across the country. We just don't have enough data to prove that it is a sort of cross-cutting trend across the country. So where we do know it's true is sort of the places you would expect that have been studied a lot like LA and DC. Um, but Kaboom has been expanding our partnerships across the country to help cities really think about and understand the importance of building new play spaces in their community. So we're now working in sort of mid-tier cities like places like Akron. Um, and Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I'm actually from, to help them think about uh, where, do, where should they be building new play spaces over the next few years. And that's what initially led me to uh, OpenStreetMap and having a really great conversation with Maggie towards the end of last year. Um, the fact of the matter is a lot of the cities we want to work with don't have the technology or the know-how to do mapping of their own play spaces, and a lot of them don't have the capacity to hire or bring on someone to do it. And so they're really starting to expand the groups that they're looking to for support in thinking about where playgrounds are within their community. And as Kaboom does our work, we really think about a cross-cutting approach across systems where we're looking at parks, but we're also looking at schools and public housing, really trying to understand what is the play landscape within a community we go to work in. And so as I, as I reached out to Maggie, I was really lucky to be introduced by a colleague to her and to the OpenStreetMap community through Baltimore and MapTime Be More. Um, 
who had done some really, really great mapping of play spaces in Baltimore that validated for us, it's possible to know where the playgrounds are, which is something we didn't have that much confidence going into it with. And through our conversation with um, Jonathan from Map Time Be More, he shared a ton about how they did the mapping of their play spaces and a real interest in sort of digging deeper beyond where our playgrounds located to what is the quality of playgrounds and how could we work together to create sort of similar to what Elliot's talking about standards for when you're mapping a play space, when you're mapping a park, what are those tags? What is it that you're looking for? What's the information that you should be including? Um, and so now we're working on starting to expand our thinking about mapping, I will say, I am not a mapping expert myself. I have a strong personal interest in it, but my background really is in um, community data and storytelling. And so as we are expanding the work we're doing and the cities we're interested in, I'm really excited to learn and hear from you all. And I've been really lucky to be working with uh, Jess and Maggie so far. Just do you mind talking a little bit about Philadelphia? Kevin was supposed to take that part, but he's my colleague and he's out sick right now. I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, just your your symptoms. It's all I, it's always this headphone <laughs> this headset. Okay, <laughs> try that again. Um, so yeah, um, we had a great conversation. Um, uh, very recently and um, decided we wanted to collaborate together um, between OpenStreetMap US and Kaboom um, and try to solve this data gap with OpenStreetMap. So um, Colleen and um, her colleagues at Kaboom identified um, Philadelphia as the next place that they would like to um, see playground data captured in OpenStreetMap. So um, that's what we are hoping to launch um, this month. Um, hopefully you can see my screen here. Um, so we launched a task in the OSM US uh, tasking manager just this week for Philadelphia. Um, so it's task 252. And so if anyone here, um, and we're going to share this with the wider community as well, um, anyone here would like to join in. Um, we are hoping to do just that, map all of the playgrounds, um, specifically as um, areas as much as possible um, so that Colleen can get that good um, uh, data for analysis to understand exactly what she was talking about, um, that equitable access to not just quality, but also the size um, of the parks and playgrounds is important. Um, so mapping the playgrounds, we've also put in there other recreational spaces as well. Um, so basketball courts, um, tennis courts, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we are going to be asking the community to help us complete um, this task. We're hoping to do it this month. I mean, we'll keep mapping, of course. Um, if we um, don't complete it this month, but it'd be really cool if we could get that done within this Parks and Recreation Month. Uh, we, during last night, there's a Teach OSM mapping hour, very similar to this, and we were able to complete 5% of the city. So that that's a really good sign of what we could do. And also, if you don't necessarily want to do the mapping, we're going to be needing validators as well. Um, and also, I don't know if anyone here is from Philadelphia or in the area, I can't remember from the intros at the beginning, um, but we're also hoping to engage with local mappers uh, to get all of that good on the ground attributes uh, that talk more about the quality and it captures more information than just what we can see from the imagery. So. Yeah, so that's what we're what we're launching this month. Um, I do also want to plug that this, even though we've been having this conversation with Kaboom for some time now, um, we're using this as part of a pilot for a lot larger program, and that is mapping for impact. And so we want to start engaging more 
with various nonprofits and other groups around the US who uh, need data exactly like this and could benefit from our community mapping and open street map. So if you, um, if you know anyone, any organization that we can similarly partner with, please definitely, definitely reach out, so.